It is now my distinct pleasure to introduce our second speaker, David Wineland of NIST and the University of Colorado at Boulder. He was also born in 1944, obviously a, a banner year for quantum physics in Milwaukee. Among his many awards prior to the Nobel Prize, he shares with our previous speaker the honor of the Einstein Prize for laser science, which he received in 1996. He was elected to the National Academy of Sciences in 1992, received the 2007 National Medal of Science in the Engineering Sciences, and received the 2010 Benjamin Franklin Medal in Physics. The title of his talk today is Superposition, Entanglement, and Raising Schrodinger's Cat. Please welcome David Weinland. Well, thank you, Daniel, and uh, thanks for uh, inviting me here. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I, I have to say, uh, just reiterate what Serge had said. I think, uh, you know, it was a great honor to receive this award, but I think it's, there could have been many other people besides myself, for sure, and it's, it, I think it's more a reflection of the, of the field rather than individual accomplishment. Um, anyway, to, to start off, you saw this picture, and I think we're all familiar with this picture of Schrodinger's cat and uh, the idea of superposition and in, in the example he cooked up was this entangled superposition correlating the state of a cat being dead or alive with the state of a, of a radioactive particle. And uh, I think the, the interesting, of course, what bothered Schrodinger, Schrodinger in part was the fact that the founding fathers of quantum mechanics that were had these discussions thinking about sim simple quantum systems, how they had ideas of superposition and entanglement. But what bothered Schrodinger, among other things, when th there's no reason that you couldn't extrapolate these ideas to to macroscopic systems, and this is he posed the, or, or rather he he he. he he evoked his his displeasure with the theory by posing this example. Well, one way out of it for Schrodinger was he said that uh, in, in this same actually the same paper that Serge quoted was this uh, th this idea that well he said well maybe maybe we're leading ourselves down the wrong path. We can think of these Gadakhan experiments with simple quantum systems, but when we scale to the macroscopic world, there it leads to these ridiculous consequences, uh, meaning in his case, the, the idea that cat could be in a superposition state. Uh, but in fact, we can now play in this world and, uh, and, and the experiments that Serge and I and many others are, are doing uh, allows us to, to play these games in these, of these original Gadakhan experiments. The systems are still pretty small, uh, but I think the ideas of scaling up, uh, we don't see any reason that, in principle, we can't scale these systems up to more macroscopic cases. Uh, so, well, anyway, what could the prescription, what we need is pre pre precise control of the, of the systems and also the isolation from the environment to get rid of this decoherence. Uh, so we can play these games with small numbers and, as, as Sir said, actually by, by design the, the, the Nobel lecture, they ask us to make this kind of our, our story of, uh, of what led to the things that, that we were cited for. Uh, so this is, a, you know, my personal story, but it, you know, involves the work of many others that I can't properly give credit to. So for me, the, I guess my career is mostly centered around high resolution spectroscopy. More, in the last 15 years or so, our group has also gotten interested in this quantum information, but we still have our eyes on spectroscopy. And I got my start in, uh, in Norman Ramsey's group in, uh, in the mid to late 60s. And at that time, uh, Norman and his close colleague, Dan Kleppner, who, who Serge already uh, mentioned, they had recently developed the hydrogen maser. Uh, so as uh, at that time, Norman wanted to have a uh, precision measurement of all the hydrogen isotopes. So I took on the project of building a deuterium maser and uh, measuring its frequency. And uh, so this is, a, this is the picture in the, 
uh, of his group in 66, and I'm standing uh, in your view on his left there, uh, trying to get close to the boss, you see. Anyway, my, my, my thesis uh, project uh, was measuring this frequency, and I like to say I'm probably the only one in the universe that has this number memorized because it was the main result of my thesis. Anyway, but one of the, one of the important things was just this experience. It, it certainly taught me to, to beware of the environment uh, to make any good uh, clock or any high resolution spectroscopy measurement you wanna carefully control or understand the environment. And even in this case, these Maser experiments, the, the, we were dealing with superpositions on the order of a second uh, as the atoms decayed inside of this Maser cavity. Uh, in my, after my uh, graduate work with uh, Norman Ramsey, I went on to Hans Stamelt's lab. Actually, I was attracted uh, to Hans Stamelt's work because he was uh, also doing high res resolution spectroscopy of, of ions. Uh, but at that time, he, he really wanted to focus on his electron G factor experiment. So that's what I did my work on. Anyway, uh, we, we, the electrons inside of a of a trap structure, some electrode structure, can uh, the, we can think of an equivalent circuit uh, of the oscillation of the electrons in this in this structure. And uh, what we can do to detect the presence of electrons, we can simply put this equivalent circuit into a simple divider circuit you see there, and, and if we drive the then the motion of the electrons, we could get a signal out which is proportional to the number of electrons. Well, one thing in these experiments that after I started there, it became clear that the, the, the systematic, ex, systematic effects in a measurement of the electron G factor could be most cl uh, closely controlled by getting down to single electrons. So that was the, one of the main parts of my work when I was a uh, postdoc there. And the basic idea is that what we did is we would put a few electrons in the, in the trap and, uh, and, and then just drive this equivalent circuit. And basically the idea is the amplitude of the electrons would be, reach a critical value where occasionally they'd get enough energy to strike the electrode and be lost. So in this case you hear, you see a loss of uh, seven electrons. And of course, the interesting case is when we get down to the to the last step, and then uh, we use that we use that to, uh, we use this calibration procedure to know when we have single electrons, and then go on to do experiments with those. Now, this was really just one of the precursors to Daimelt's uh, group, his his their measurement on the accurate measurement of the electron G factor, uh, and uh, which. As many of you know, he, Daimelt shared the Nobel Prize actually in the same year as, as Ramsey for, in part for his measurement of the electron G factor. At that time also, I still had my mind on spectroscopy and certainly Daimelt did too. And uh, we were thinking about some ideas how to control the motion, particularly freeze out one mode of motion of these electrons in the trap. And that led to some ideas about laser cooling and at the same time, uh, uh, Ted Hansch and Art Shallow had some ideas about laser cooling, and they, they didn't look so much the same at, the, at that time, but they're really the same basic idea. So uh, at, uh, after my postdoc, I went to NBS, uh, National Bureau of Standards, which later became the uh, NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology. My first task w uh, there was to at that time, NIST didn't have a, an operating cesium clock, so there was some urgency to get one working, and so that's what I spent my first year, or year and a half or so. But my, my boss there, my group leader at that time, uh, had a more forward-thinking view of what NIST should be doing. Sorry. Slip this down. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Anyway, my boss at that time, uh, NIST was, at least the time in Frick's division, was more of a, uh, a service organization calibrating other devices and uh, running, of course, making a device that would realize the definition of time to second, the cesium beam standard. But he, he was 
uh, keen on developing other ideas of spectroscopy, and I was still interested in ions, so he got us some money to allow us to pursue laser cooling. And uh, at, at that time, uh, actually, uh, my Dame Malt, my, my postdoc advisor, I know he had, he had gone to take a sabbatical in Peter Tushuk's group in, in Germany. So I knew they were working on this, trying to demonstrate this idea of laser cooling. And so I knew they were working on it. I don't think they knew we were working on it, but in a, uh, the, we had papers that came out about the same time. Our, our paper was published a little earlier, but in a near coincidence, you see the submission dates here. They, uh, their paper uh, actually made it to the FISRA letters one day earlier, so they, they won this race, I guess you could say. Anyway, um, so in those experiments, in the, in the Heidelberg experiments of Peter Toshek's group, they could, the evidence in both cases was pretty crude, but the, uh, they could see this, the effect of the laser cooling through the enhanced lifetime depending on the, of the ions in the trap, depending on the tuning of the, the lasers. And in our case, we could, we actually taking what I had learned in Daymelt's lab, that looking at the, in this case, the induced, th uh, or the thermal currents rather than the driven currents, we had a direct measure of temperature and we could do this crude measurement of the cooling effect when we tuned the laser frequency to the, to the red end of the resonance transition. So this was, this was our, not long after that, this was the, the ion storage group uh, in, in Boulder. And uh, these, are, these are my colleagues at that time. And uh, one of the embarrassing things, there, one of the nice things is that we actually spent our whole career together and still work together. And uh, one of the embarrassing things is this is us <laughs> now, and you can see uh, Wayne Atano and Jim Burquist, they, they look pretty much the same, but some of the, some of the rest of us didn't fare so well over the years. <laughs> anyway, so, so one of the things for the same, uh, in, in the case, as was the case for the electrons, uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in the high resolution spectroscopy, trying to make uh, clocks out of ions, we, it was also the case that the smallest, we could get the smallest systematic effects for various reasons uh, in spectroscopy if we could go down to one ion. So there was a push to get on to one ion. And uh, actually, in this case, uh, Peter Toshek's group beat us out and by a larger margin. In this case, they were able to isolate uh, single ions. And in fact, in the case of barium, barium fluoresces in the deep blue part of the spectrum, but you can actually see a, a, barium, a single barium ion uh, with your eye through a microscope and it kind of looks like a faint star. Uh, but in any case, this, this, these, these were some of the first experiments getting down to uh, single ions. Uh, and, it, and as I say, what, our, our main interest even then was still to, 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 to make a clock with, a, with an ion. So, uh, we, we fo at NIST or at NPS then, we focused on mercury uh, mainly for two reasons. And the one was that uh, in, it, it had a, a hyperfine transition in the ground state, uh, which was about the, it is about the highest, I think it is the highest that anybody considers for making a microwave clock. So that was an attraction. It also has a, interesting optical transition. The, the uh, upper D level I show there uh, has a lifetime of about a tenth of a second. So, the, so if we could realize the lifetime limited resolution of this transition, we could make a very accurate clock. So that was, what we pursued starting in about 1980 when we pursued these experiments on mercury. Uh, and uh, so one of the questions was, uh, uh, at that time, uh, sort of a side issue was uh, what happens in this, uh, I should back up here. Normally what we think about doing is to do spectroscopy to avoid the perturbing effects of the cooling laser, the one on the left there. Uh, we, we basically alternate these two lasers. So we probe the clock transition uh, and then turn that laser off and then probe the, look for the fluorescence if the ion is promoted to the ex excited state, then the 
fluorescence turns off and we can easily tell when the ion makes this quadrupole transition to the D state. Uh, in the, so one of the sort of interesting things at that time was the question was, and this actually goes back to Schrodinger again, uh, is I, asking the question of are there, are there quantum jumps? And one way this, this idea was manifested uh, was that people posed the problem, what if you turn on both of these lasers at the same time, what do you see? Well, certainly you can expect the, if you're driving the S to D transition in this, in this picture, then the, 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 the ion's gonna spend some time in the D state, and so the fluorescence on average with a, from this strong cooling transition would diminish, but would it diminish gradually or would it switch? And in fact, the answer was uh, that it switches suddenly. So with both lasers on, you see uh, spectra, or you see fluorescence uh, from the strong transition, the one on the left there, uh, that looks like this. And, and so basically, uh, when the atom is in the ground state, it can scatter light on this uh, from the laser on the left. And when it's in the D state, it switches off the fluorescence. So you see these quantum jump effects. Uh, so, uh, well, of course, one of the things, uh, we, we were doing laser cooling at that time, but it would be interesting to get down to the ground state of, of motion uh, and in this diagram here, you, of course, I don't have to talk about here. I show the classical picture. You can think of like a single ion uh, being a marble in the bowl. But the, of course, in, in the quantum world, we know we have to think about the, the uh, quantized levels of, of energy, of, of motional energy. For the case of ions, the, the motion is very harmonic. So we can uh, hear the... Uh, so we deal with this harmonic oscillator with emotion and a strong connection with what Serge and his group does is that the harmonic oscillator in their experiment is this single mode of the radiation field in the cavity. For us, it's this mechanical, uh, mechanical motion. But the connection then becomes very strong because we use the, at the internal states of the atom to connect the, to the harmonic oscillators. Uh, so we'll, uh, one thing, well, what, what does the spectrum look like when we probe it uh, uh, and, and can resolve these, these motional effects? Uh, uh, so one, one way to view it classically, of course, if you're sitting on the ion that's moving back and forth, the laser is frequency modulated, so you expect to see an absorption spectrum shown down on the bottom there that, that, that represents this frequency modulation spectrum that the ion sees. Uh, another way to view this is in the in the quantum picture is that the carrier, the center of the feature of the of the spectrum, represents transitions where the atom goes, say, from the ground state to to the excited internal state, but the motional state doesn't remains the same. And uh, in the, also in the quantum picture, then if the the upper sideband in this spectrum represents the case where the uh, the, the emotional quantum, uh, quantum state has changed by, by one in this example from n equal two to n equal three. Similarly, for going to the lower side band, it's where the case where the ion loses one quantum of energy as it makes the internal state transition. Uh, and this is, this, this is, this is very much like the, I guess, let me go on here. Um, so anyway, one, one, one thing to do just out of curiosity and also for, to get rid of uh, Doppler shifts, particularly time dilation shifts in spectroscopy is to be able to freeze out the motion, at least limited only by, the, uh, by quantum mechanics, that is get down to the quantum ground state of motion. And so when the, the way this cooling to the ground state works is, is actually in, in the end pretty simple. We, we work in a, regime where uh, when, when the atom decays, it will, it will primarily, it will do it basically without, with a very high probability without changing the emotional quantum number. And this we call the, we tend to call this the Lambdicke regime, but it's, it's very analogous to the Mostbauer effect where you can think of the recoil from the photon actually goes into the apparatus that holds the the ion, and so in fact, we 
we, we, this is the, this is the uh, situation we live in. So uh, it, the way we can do the cooling then is actually very simple, is that uh, you remember we can drive what we call the red sideband where the motion reduces by one quantum, and then when the atom decays, it comes down primarily without changing its motional uh, quantum state. So in the, overall, in the scattering process, when we re reduce the motion by one quantum, and basically all we do to, to, to cool at the ground state then is we leave the laser on and the ion eventually works its way down the ladder of states and, and, and resides in the ground state. And of course, we don't do this perfectly, uh, uh, but we can, we can sense when the ion is in the ground state because the, the, uh, the, when, it, when it's in the lower uh, internal state and we try to drive this red sideband, there's no level for it to go to. Uh, so the scattering stops and we can, we, can, we can see this when we get down to the ground state. The, on the right hand view on the bottom there is the expanded scale of this, of, of, the, of the lower, uh, the red and the blue sideband, the first sidebands from the carrier. And we see this, this strong asymmetry and it's fairly simple then to determine what's the, what the mean quantum number of the oscillator is in this case, and uh, from this we could demonstrate that we were cooling much, at least much less uh, than uh, a single motion, uh, motion quantum on average. Uh, I should also mention, I'm not gonna say a lot about quantum logic, but I'll say uh, just some, you know, some broad uh, features of the quantum information experience, uh, experiments. But in this picture, it illustrates uh, kind of this conditional dynamics, which is the basis for, for logic gates and the experiments we do with ions and, and atoms. That is, that you can imagine in this, if, the, if, the, if, we, if we isolate, if we use, have one a qubit in our system be the ground and first excited state of motion in this diagram, you can see when the, when the ion is in the ground state of motion, then we can't drive this transition on the other hand, if it's an n equal one level, we can make the transition, the S to D transition in this example here. And it's this conditional dynamics which sets up the logic gates that we use in this quantum information experiments. So let me, I'm gonna jump back to the clocks for a minute. Actually, the, our work on the, on, on the mercury ion, uh, Jim Berquist is really the main person, has been the main person on this over, over many years. And, Anyway, just to give you a kind of idea where we were able to get to, the, there's, there's many features here, but the, the trapping, just the trapping alone, of course, gets rid of the first order Doppler shift. Uh, the atom, basically the average velocity of the ion is zero, so the first order Doppler shift goes in way. Uh, laser cooling allows us to, to reduce the so-called second order Doppler effect, the effect of time dilation. And these effects are very small, but that the precisions we get to, they're, they're, they're important effects. And so the laser cooling really helps with this, suppressing these, these shifts, in this case, the time dilation shift. Uh, just another feature we, in this experiment, we, uh, we went to, uh, to, to make the system, cry, uh, the apparatus cryogenic. The main reason was not so much to, one, one effect we have to worry about is black body. Uh, uh, electric field shifts from, uh, from black body radiation, and we can, get, we can suppress that highly by going to 4 Kelvin. The main reason here was that the, it turns out at room temperature, even though the system is in a fairly high vacuum, the, the, it turns out mercury, when it's in this excited D state, if it collides with a neutral mercury, it makes it radiatively associates to make a dimer, and which kills the ion, and, and in the Experiments at room temperature, the, it's hard to get rid of mercury once, once it's in a system. And uh, the lifetimes of the ions were typically about 10 minutes. So, so we, we went uh, to four Kelvin, the lifetime literally went to months. In one case, we had an ion for over six months. Anyway, this, this after a long, we started this in, in 1981 and, and, uh, and finally in 2006, uh, primarily due to Jim Berkowitz and others' uh, efforts. We finally reached a, a, a stage where we could claim a systematic uncertainty below the, below cesium, and 
This was the first time any clock could do that. Actually, what amazes me is that the cesium standard or cesium atoms were chosen as the as the standard that defines the second and uh, officially in 1965, but of course they were developed about 10 years earlier. And what amazes me is that up until 2006, they were, uh, cesium clocks were the best in terms of, of systematic effects. And so this kind of, this experiment, this was done on, a, on the optical transition and this was the first time uh, that we could exceed the, the or re reduce the systematic errors below those of cesium. And I, I think really signaled the, the, the advent of optical atomic clocks. And I've focused uh, here on a work in our lab, but there's many other groups uh, working on uh, other similar ions uh, to do these, to make optical clocks with. And I don't, I don't have time to give credit to, proper credit to all the people, but this work is reviewed in this paper here. Uh, well, okay, so about in 1995, the, the, this idea of quantum information, quantum computing, uh, uh, be, you know, came very apparent, with, uh, particularly with Peter Shor's algorithm for efficiently factorizing large numbers. Uh, in the atomic physics world, actually, we weren't plugged into... Uh, the journals that Peter Shore and others would would write in, but Arthur Eckert, who has already had established himself, particularly in the area of quantum communication, uh, he gave a, a talk at an international conference on atomic physics uh, meeting in in Boulder, and uh, kind of told us about this idea. And I think it's fair to say I think most atomic physicists weren't aware of this idea of quantum computing. Two people in the audience at that meeting were uh, Peter Zoller and, and Ignacio Serac. Uh, and uh, they, they, I think many of you in the condensed matter community know them now because they, they've contributed some ideas uh, to, to, to your area as well. But at that, anyway, at that time they were, uh, they, they were on to, uh, they certainly understood in what we could do and what we couldn't do with trapped ions and they immediately jumped on this idea of, uh, uh, and were really made the first proposal for a comprehensive quantum computer. And uh, the idea was that very simply is that the qubits in our system then are the internal states, uh, which I just labeled with spin up, spin down, denoting a two level system. They can be hyperfine levels, they can be optical levels. And, but the key thing was that they realized that they, uh, it, it, of course, what's important is make gates between ions. And in their, in their uh, proposal, what they uh, zero it in on is that if we make this, well, in the ideal world, we use laser cooling, we freeze out the motion of the, all modes of motion of this, in this case, five ions in this ion trap. And then uh, we, since the mode frequencies are generally all different, you can isolate spectrally one of these modes if you take the ground and first excited state of one of these modes, that forms a qubit. And the interesting part about that qubit is it's in general for, for all, in general for any of the modes of motion, the, the, the motion is shared amongst all lines. So this qubit is then in some sense shared amongst all lines. So the, the basic idea of their proposal was that if you, to make a, a gate between two ions, uh, the idea was that if you could first with a laser beam, a focused laser beam, if you could map the, the internal state superposition of, of that selected ion onto the motional qubit starting where it starts in the ground state. And then if you could somehow do a gate between the spin and the motional qubit uh, on a second selected ion, then you've basically done a gate between the, the two selected ions. And, uh, and so I won't go through the details, it's a little more, complicated than what I indicated about the absence of the red sideband a, a few view graphs ago. But anyway, we were, uh, we were kind of thinking of playing these games before the, the quantum computing wave uh, hit. And so we could jump on this and we could demonstrate a con the, the, the control, or in our case it was controlled not, but it basically a logic gate between, this, between the motional states and the internal states. Uh, and this was uh, led by Chris Monroe, who was in our group from 92 to 2000. 
Uh, so I'm gonna, I, I, I can't do, give proper credit, as I said, to, to all the people doing, uh, working on these ideas of quantum information. I'm gonna give a couple of egocentric examples here in, in our group. Uh, uh, first of all, there's been many groups around the world uh, doing simple algorithm demonstrations. Uh, in our group, uh, Didi Leibfried has led a lot of this work. Uh, uh, Serge mentioned that I think, uh, you know, I, the question was asked, well, when, when is a quantum computer going to come? And it depends on what you want it for. And I think, of course, in 95, this big wave of interest hit because of Shor's algorithm, but I think that's by far the hardest problem that anybody's thought of. And I think that's quite a ways out. But I think what people are, Excited, most physicists are excited about it, this idea of simulations. And, and very crudely, I'll get, you know, give one example. This, in this picture here that next to John Bollinger, that's a picture of, it's a different kind of trap than I indicated before, but it's, it shows a triangular lattice of beryllium mines that we can, we can make. And what, what we can do with uh, using state dependent uh, 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 laser forces, you can, make each ion uh, an oscillating dipole, and then uh, depending on their states, these, these oscillating dipoles are different. And the basic idea of this experiment that is shown in the picture there is that you can, you can have these, dip these interacting dipoles act like spin-spin uh, couplings. And uh, so one of the top popular topics that these ion groups and other atomic physics groups are, are are pursuing this idea to be able to simulate quantum magnets. And so this work goes on in several laboratories. Chris Monroe, who's now at the University of Maryland, has a project on that, and also to be a Schutz and Freiburg, and there's several other groups now, just, to, just with ions that are work pursuing this. Reiner Blot, the person on the bottom there, is certainly, uh, he's one of our strongest competitors, but, but he's also been a friend for a long time. And, He's, he's actually got the best system in terms of fidelity of gates and measure that is he can uh, gate between, uh, uh, say a controlled on any logic gate between two ions is he can reach a fidelity of over 99%, which is I think the best of any, anybody's uh, logic gates. And he's gone on to at least make the first demonstrations of a universal simulator uh, that is being able to simulate any Hamiltonian with the operations they can do with their ions. And it's, I, all of these experiments right now are at the point where we can simulate uh, the results that we can produce, we can simulate efficiently on a classical computer. But I think Serge mentioned that, I think we're, we feel we're close and not just we the ion people, but other uh, groups are close to being able to simulate a system that we can't, that are, that's intractable on a classical computer. So I think we're all excited about that. And I've only fe featured a, a few people here, but there's many more. And to give you an idea, uh, these, are, these are just the uh, ion groups around the world that, that talk about doing quantum information related things. Uh, uh, and, uh, and, and of course, there's many other platforms that are people are looking uh, at these ideas uh, of quantum computing. And I think, I, I must say, I think this is largely uh, due to this interest just among the ion groups is largely due to Peter Zoller and Ignacio Serac. I mean, we, we always had this idea, we had this clock problem, which was, was was certainly uh, satisfying enough, but the, but they really they really pumped up the field with their ideas. Um, anyway, coming back to this notion of Schrodinger's cat, we could make a, a little simple version of Schrodinger's cat. And what we did uh, this was again when Chris Monroe was in our group, and uh, the basic our little version of Schrodinger's cat was we start with a single ion in the in the trap and. Uh, say in the lower energy state. And then what we first do is make a superposition state of the, of the ground and ex, uh, in, internal ground and excited states. And what we can do with lasers is that uh, using dipole forces of uh, selected polarization, what we can do is we can 
generate a, a laser dipole force that acts, in this example, only on the on what, what I'm calling the spin-up state here, on the, uh, on the upper energy state. And what we can do is we can use this dipole force to excite the motion of the ion, but when it's in the superposition state, when, what happens is we separate the, the spatial parts of the, com, of, the, uh, of the wave function that are correlated with the internal state. So we can make, at some instant in time, the spin-up state will be on the left side of the, of the trap, as indicated in the cartoon. And just uh, for symmetry reasons, we, what we then did in this experiment is we flipped the spins, uh, the internal states, and then we again applied this dipole force, but with a different phase relative to the first excitation. And we could end up with a state like this, where the, at some instant of the time, the, the, the ion would be uh, both on the left side of the bowl and the right side of the bowl correlated with the internal state. And what, so we're saying this is, this is very much like Schrodinger's cat, the microscopic uh, property. And Schrodinger's example was a single radioactive particle. And in our case, it's the internal state of the ion and the more macroscopic uh, uh, part of it, which mimics the cat and Schrodinger's example is this more classical motion and the idea that the ion can be uh, uh, on, on say the left on the right side of the bowl at the same time. Well, this is, this is a pretty small example. And in, in, this, in, this, in this experiment here that we did in, in, reported in 96, the separation of the wave packets, these coherent states that, that represent the motion is only about eight times the size of the wave packet. So you might not dignify this with calling it a Schrodinger's cat. That is, it's, the motion isn't really that classical. But I think what's interesting here, of course, is that if you say it's too small, then where do you make the dividing line? I mean, in principle, we could make these, we should be able to make the separation much more macroscopic. There's, we, we, there's decoherence processes that, that Serge mentioned that we can identify, but we know what they are. And in principle, we should be able to get rid of them to make much larger states. So where this dividing line is, is basically unclear at this point. Let me give you a little idea of the way the, uh, the experiments work. Actually, where uh, what we call our little quantum computer occupies a tiny space in the lab, and we're dominated by these lasers to, to manipulate the internal states of the ion. One connection with, the, or some connection with the work that goes on in the condensed matter community here is that uh, it turns out that in a very uh, I mean, this is a very simple picture, but uh, one thing for to, to get the speed of uh, the, uh, the logic gates up, and which is basically limited by the motional frequencies that it can generate, we, we want to go to small traps. Uh, and uh, that's simply because for given potentials that we apply to these electrodes, the, the oscillation frequencies go up as the dimensions go down. So we've been, we've been uh, obliged to go to use lithographic techniques. And so we, we're, we're on the right-hand figure is, a, is, is what we call a, a planar uh, electrode trap where the electrodes are all in a plane made lithographic and the ions uh, float above the, uh, the plane of the electrodes. And each one of these tiny squares you can see in the, in the oval-shaped uh, uh, figure there is a, is, a, is a zone where we can hold ions. So our idea of scaling up is to actually move ions, or move ions around in such an array. And there's quite a bit of work going on in this. And uh, actually, the, the, the real pro, we've made this example in our lab uh, with the help of the uh, condensed matter, or the um, superconducting qubit group in, uh, at NIST in Boulder. Uh, but there are places like GTR and Sandia who's doing they're doing a much nicer job these days on making these structures. So one of the one of the things that gets us also close to the condensed matter community is that one of the dirty effects that we see in these experiments that this shows a this picture shows a side on view of one of our surface electrode traps. So uh, the ions again float on, on the order of tens of microns to 100 microns above the surface. And one thing we notice is that the ions heat up due to some noise, electric noise. We don't know the cause of that. 
but it's been plaguing all, all the ion groups. And so one thing we've done in our group is, is to hook up with uh, Dustin Height, uh, Kyle McKay and, uh, in the group of Dave Pappas in Boulder. And uh, we, we, we decided to get serious about this problem. And so one of the first things we did, just using a standard cleaning technique used in surface science is that just by spraying the, by, by bombarding the surface with argon ions, we were able to reduce this heating by a factor of 100. We still, it's still larger than what we would expect thermal electronic noise to be, so there's a lot to do. But anyway, uh, this, this may end up being, maybe we'll never make a quantum computer, but it might end up being a tool on surface science because the, the ions are extremely sensitive to, to electric field noise. And just, I could make many examples here, just a couple that, that, that I thought were interesting and, and because the, of the connection to what we do with our ions. These are uh, uh, two-dimensional electron gas experiments. I just, uh, and I, I know there's many groups working on this. I selected these pictures from Charlie, uh, upper picture from Charlie Marcus's group. But the basic idea is it looks kind of like our ion traps. In this case, they put pairs of electrons in these, in these structures to, and due to the, the exchange interaction between the electrons and make uh, states that can act as qubits. This, this more recent picture down at the bottom here is, is one of, I think, a, more than, there's several groups working on this, but now they're able to move electrons between these different zones of these, of these quantum dot qubits. And uh, so there's a lot of, a lot of analogies to the uh, between the, the atomic experiments and condensed matter experiments. One thing I, I, I just show this picture, I know there's many groups uh, uh, discussing these things at this meeting here. This is a group from our, this is a picture from the group down the hall from us led by uh, Ray Simmons where basically they're using Joseph's injunction qubits coupled together with strip lines and I, I, I show this with envy because we've had this experiment on mind uh, for ions for for about 30 years now, and we just can't get the couplings up high enough. I'm, so I'm very envious of the high couplings that the, 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 that you all get with the coupling, for example, Joseph's junctions to the strip line cavities. And we would hopefully like to do that sometime, but you guys are way ahead of us on that. Let me come back to the clocks again, uh, some of the work uh, we, we, uh, with these ideas of quantum information, we've, we've tried to take advantage of, uh, of some of the basic ideas uh, to, to help us with our clocks. And this is, uh, this is a, 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 clock, a clock, an optical clock based on uh, aluminum ions. And you can see the upper state in this aluminum ion has a even longer lifetime, which in principle even narrower resonances. This work led by Till Rosenvan in our group. Uh, uh, anyway, that we in principle we could detect it like we do with mercury. There's an allowed transition that we could look for changes in fluorescence on. Uh, unfortunately, this is at a, such a short wavelength we just can't in practice get a, a CW laser at that short wavelength. So basically, what we do is we put a we use some real basic ideas of, of the quantum information experiments where we put a, a aluminum ion in with, a, in this case, a magnesium ion in the trap. And I mentioned in the Serac and Zoller scheme, you map the internal state of the qubit onto the motion. And we do that, we basically use that idea twice. We map the, 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 the internal states of the of the aluminum onto a motional state superposition, and then we map that back onto the magnesium, which it turns out we can easily detect with this uh, uh, state-dependent fluorescence method. So there's a lot of things that are interesting about this this clock. One of the, some of the things we we were thinking about when we started this experiment, but uh, uh, some of them we didn't think about. One is that uh, the uh, of course we can. Uh, if we normally, when we probe the clock transitions, of course, we don't want to be doing any direct cooling on the ion because the, the cooling has dissipation and it kills the clock level. So, but what we can do in this experiment is we cool the magnesium ion, uh, and its wavelength is quite a bit different than the aluminum, so it doesn't interfere with the aluminum. But we can do continuous cooling, and the reason that's important is 
even in these experiments on aluminum now, we're getting to probe times of, of well over a second. Uh, and the ions would heat up and we'd get this second order, so-called second order Doppler or time dilation shift. Anyway, there's, there's, some, there's some nice advantages of doing this uh, doing this uh, method where we map the, the clock state onto our logic, so-called logic ion. Anyway, we're now down uh, to levels, uh, the, system, or the systematic effect, uh, that is the, the systematic un uncertainty expressed fractionally is below a part in 10 to the 17. And there's a lot of interesting things to, that come into play at that level. One thing is the, the fact that uh, uh, we have to worry about the, uh, the gravitational redshift. So just to calibrate you, uh, if we, if the, on, on, at sea level on Earth, if the gravitational potential redshift corresponds to uh, that if you had a clock and you raise it 10 centimeters, that, sh that shifts the frequency uh, higher by a part in 10 to the 17. So these are things we, have to worry about with these clocks. So as, as kind of a demonstration here, this is a very low quality picture, but you get the idea. This is, a, this is one of our aluminum clocks on, a, on one of the optical tables. To, to, so to be able to measure this shift, uh, James Chow here, one of the uh, postdocs uh, did that, raised up the table and we measured, we could measure the shift. We had a second aluminum clock that we could compare to. Now they, you'll see, although we agree with what uh, Einstein would say, it's not a, it's certainly not a precision measurement. But what it does say is that we have to worry about these effects now to, at a, at extremely precise level. And actually, one of the dilemmas that we have now in our clock experiments is that we, uh, the the uncertainty and the gravitational potential, say in a place like Boulder with the mountains around, is about plus or minus. 30 centimeters. So in order to make accurate clock comparisons, there's only way to do it is to bring the clocks together, which is kind of lousy, even though we can connect them over long distances. We have this problem with the gravitational potential redshift. Well, anyway, I want to say, uh, you know, uh, the, certainly that I've been lucky in this to, to work with these these guys, the um, uh, people there, John Bollinger, um, uh, Jim Berkowitz, Wayne Natano, and Bob Drelling and I have, have worked together since about 1980. More recently, Dee Dee Leipfried and uh, Till Rosenman have joined our group. And I mentioned that Till was a, or excuse me, that Chris Monroe was an important part of the group in, uh, from about 92 to 2000. And, but of course, we, you know, the real work was done by a huge number of students and postdocs and visitors over the uh, years. We, <clears throat> we've had great institutional support. I, I've had uh, the first people I met list there are my immediate bosses over the years, and they've always been very supportive. Catherine Gibby, <clears throat> who is um, our laboratory director, uh, has always been very supportive. And certainly <clears throat> one measure of her success is that uh, after uh, Bill Phillips and uh, Eric Cornell and Jan Hall, I'm the fourth person to uh, receive the, the prize under her directorship, so he's, she's been extremely important. And also, we've been had great support from the agencies over the years. Just a couple of, of words words about the, the, the uh, <coughs> ceremonies in Stockholm. I mean, it, I mean, it really was, it was a wonderful experience, but really surreal, I must say. I mean, you know, most physicists are out of their element in this sort of situation. And, uh, anyway, this was a picture of the award ceremonies. You can see on the front row on the left are, the, are this year's laureates and the royal family is on the right side of the stage there. Anyway, after the award ceremony, the king and queen invited a few people over for dinner. And <laughs> so you see, actually, one of the interesting things is, and it's not surprising when you think about it, that so each, officially each laureate uh, is it, is allowed to bring uh, twelve guests and to these to these major functions, uh, and so if you, there were nine laureates this year, if you add up the numbers, that's about a hundred people. Well, um, that there's about twelve hundred at this dinner party, and so you know there's a lot of 
Swedish officials, Swedish society, you can so you can see that in addition to their I mean, you know, the Swedes are very proud of this of this award, but they, it's also a big deal for for Swedish society and officialdom. So, anyway, but it was a wonderful experience, and um, the, you know, the whole the whole week we were very busy, but we were well taken care of. And the last thing is that um, I feel really fortunate to uh, have shared this with Sears. Uh, we, you know, I've admired his physics for before I knew him, but we got to know each other about 25 years ago, and we, in our families, our wives had gotten to know each other, and, and, and it's been, been great to, to have him as a friend as well as a colleague. So thanks. Thank you, Dave, for a fascinating talk. And once again, uh, we have time for questions. Yes, please. Uh, before I repeat the question, um, I would like to point out to all the people that are leaving that we have a very distinguished guest uh, who will be uh, speaking right after we end the question session. Uh, if you don't mind sticking around, uh, it would be greatly appreciated. And the question was about uh, hobbies. Yeah, so, well, when I, if I understood your question, I, you know, I must say I wasn't, in a, I, I, I got on to physics in high school and I took my first physics class and I really like the the way math and you know simple math could actually describe a lot of what we see around. I must say in high school I was more interested in cars and motorcycles than I was in physics. So I even though I kept my grades up I I, w I certainly wasn't the top student, but I don't think that was a I don't think that was a bad thing in the sense that uh just by working on these larger mechanical systems, I mean, you learn a lot. And I think I, think I actually benefited from that. And uh, uh, I was able to see that, that, that probably what my future wasn't being a car mechanic. <laughs> so, but anyway, I think, I think, you know, even though that wasn't directly related to physics, I think it was a big help for me to, to have that kind of hobby. Yes, sir. I'm just wondering, what, what is the best clock now that people actually make? And uh, what would be the best kind of portable clock that, yeah. well, the uh, one with it, the, that they're using cesium, I think? Well, the, the one with the small clock. systematic is this, is this aluminum clock I, I mentioned. Uh, you know, there's always this, we're, we're, as a government, uh, as a NIST employee, I'm not able to call it the most accurate clock because accurate is officially is a tied to how well do you realize the second, which is based on the definition, which is cesium. But you know, just as as a scientist, I don't care so much about that. We want to have the lowest systematic effect. So right now, it's this aluminum clock. Well, I was also wondering, you know, what it's something that somebody has made and it sits there ticking away, and people are using it. Not the most accurate necessarily that you can make, but what's the you know, practical clock that people made. Or well, again, you know, maybe you maybe you're asking there there are clocks that 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 run at the same rate for long periods of times, and and uh, uh, I mean, we the longest we've run our clocks is and these ion clocks is maybe on the order of days. So there's practical clocks that can can act as flywheels, we say, for very long periods of time. And actually, the hydrogen maser is still one that that, that serves that role. So it, it depends on the exact application, but there are, there are clocks that are, are at least as stable as the ones we can make with the ions. Over there, please. When did you know that you were first going to start working with lasers? 
when, when did I, when did I? I start to work with laser rather oh. than laser. Well, actually, it was with, so my, in my postdoc work, that was the electron work, that was RF spectroscopy. And then uh, when I went to NIST and we were able to start this experiment on the laser cooling, actually, I didn't know anything about lasers. This, my colleague that I mentioned there, Bob Drellinger, or I think I showed his picture, uh, he, was the, he was the laser guy on, the, on those first experiments, and you know, I and others learned from him. So it was really, so anyway, that was, uh, that was in the 76, 77. So, so my sort of extended comment is that John Armstrong, who's the one who hired me, I graduated from Harvard College in 56, and then he was staying at Harvard for graduate school, and he asked his advisors if he'd like to do some optics. And I said, no, optics is a dead field. <laughs> he did NMR. Uh -huh. uh, one Bloomberg is the Nobel Prize. So John likes to point out that um, you know they, they advised him that optics was, was dead, that the old field and worked for something else, but uh, the laser obviously changed that. And uh, anyway, congratulations. <laughs> Thanks. Well, I think uh, you know just another side comment. When I was a graduate student, mid to late sixties, the you know physics at that time was particle physics. And uh, I guess, you know, I, I think, you know, in part the reason I, I, I went into atomic physics was it wasn't obviously the, the hot field then, but I liked the aspect of being on a small experiment where you wouldn't get lost in a big group. And so that was really at least one factor why I went the way I did. A uh, question over there? Um, yeah, with, with the sensitivity to the uh, gravitational redshift that you were talking about, would that uh, point toward um, gravitational radiation detection with any of these devices or uh, gra gravitational wave detection? I mean, would there? It probably, I, okay, so the question was can, you know, with this sensitivity to, to gravitational potential redshift, does it help with gravity, gravity waves? And I think it, 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 it's a little bit apples and oranges in the sense that, uh, yes, we can use our clocks for, uh, in principle, for sensing gravity waves, but we have a signal to noise problem, especially since we're dealing with one atom. We, we just don't have the signal to noise to particularly to, to respond to, say, bursts of gravitational waves. It's not, in principle, it's there, but it's just not practical with the kind of things we're doing, I think. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, I was just curious, so when do you think it would be feasible for us to have our own like personal uh, gravi gravitational time dilation clocks we can just you know, carry around or something? I, I, I'm sorry, I just couldn't hear. Could you repeat the question, please? When, when do you think we'll have our own like personal uh, gravitational time dilation clocks oh. we could carry around and measure how, young, how much younger we are? Uh, well, not, not anytime soon, probably. <laughs> Actually, the, I mean, the one thing is that, I mean, you know, we, I mentioned the problem. We have two clocks, have to have two clocks together to compare. Uh, but we can, we can turn that around. And so the, the hope is to be able to do geodesy, basically, another form of navigation by mapping the, using the gravitational potential redshift. But, but the, anyway, the, these guys, uh, Till Rosenband, who leads the project in our group, he, he's got his heart set on making a, a portable device, but it probably won't, won't be able to buy one at, uh, down at uh, <laughs> Walmart or wherever you go to shop very, very soon. So uh, another uh, speculation about the future question. Uh, you mentioned that uh, quantum simulators are probably going to be the first uh, kind of killer app for uh, quantum computation. Um, do you have a sense of when uh, they might outperform classical computers? Well, I, you know, it may be. I think people are you know, people are already starting to claim that you know, with 
on the order of 20 qubits that you get to problems that are intractable on, uh, to, to be solved by a, 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 cl a normal classical computer. But I think that, I think the real break point is, at least my, this is just me and maybe some other people feel, but the real break point will be where with some quantum simulator, whether it's science or superconducting qubits or whatever, that I think the real, what'll, what'll put the whole field on the map is where we can do some simulation that tells us something interesting that we hadn't thought of before. And uh, so I think that, and I would, you know, I, I would say we're not very far away. I mean, or at least I could, let me say it this way, I could believe that might happen in the next decade. So it may not, but I could certainly believe it. Factoring, on the other hand, don't, don't invest in a factoring computer company right now. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you very much.